Good morning, church. Today's reading will be taken from 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1 to 7. And this can be found on page 1220. I read. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's suffering, who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you're willing, as God wants you to be. Not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. Not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the cheap shepherd, shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. In the same way, you who were younger, submit yourselves to your elders. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility towards one another, because, because God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. This is the reading of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, everyone. It's lovely to see you all. Uh, many faces that I'm very pleased to see again uh, some new ones as well I'm getting a bit of that experience that I was just sitting there reflecting that you know at the beginning of Paul's letters he often says you know I thank God for what I've heard about you but I'm getting a bit of that coming back and seeing you just still here keep going some new numbers added to your midst and it is a great thing and a real joy to be back I look forward to catching up with you afterwards do keep that passage, 1 Peter 5, open if you have it in front of you, and I will uh, lead us in a prayer. Father, I thank you um, for these words that you have written to guide your church, that we might know how to live in these days that we live. I pray that as uh, I speak, that the Holy Spirit would be doing his work to helping us to understand and apply these words that our lives might bring great glory to you and glory to your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, I wonder if you remember that story about James and John, the disciples of Jesus, that time when they went to Jesus to ask him for a favour. I spoke at a service recently where I spoke about favours you might do for a friend. I found some quite good statistics. I thought I'd share them with you today. Apparently 90% of friends would stop what they're doing and go and help a friend if their car had broken down. About 80% would give their friend a kidney, which I thought was quite a lot. But only 40% would get a matching tattoo with a friend. Well, this wasn't a favour like that. What James and John wanted was something quite different. They wanted the most important seats in Jesus' kingdom. Now, that's quite a request. What I actually find quite amusing about it is that in Matthew's Gospel, it tells us that it was their mum who actually started the conversation. Make of that, I think, what you will. Well, Jesus, he says no. But what's interesting for us today as we come to this passage is the comparison he then makes comparing the ways of the world to how his disciples ought to live in the area of authority. So in the world, he says, those with authority lord it over others. But then in Jesus' kingdom, those who are great, who want to be great, must actually be those who serve. And he then says those well-known words, Mark 10, 45, for even the Son of Man, that's Jesus, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life 
as a ransom for many. While we're here towards the end of 1 Peter, the letter Peter wrote to scattered Christians. I hope you've been enjoying it. I particularly enjoyed getting into it a little bit this week. I suspect all these encouragements for suffering Christians are only going to be more important for us. And what a privilege to be God's own people, precious, chosen, destined for glory. And I'm sure you've seen as the weeks have gone by how Peter offers a pattern of life, a way of living as the chosen people in a hostile world. And then last week, I haven't heard last week's sermon, but I'm sure you'll have seen that this pattern is actually, it's the pattern of Christ that we follow in his footsteps. That because Jesus suffered, we will suffer. But that because Jesus was raised to glory, we also are raised and will be raised to glory. Suffering, then glory. I guess he could put it like this, kind of being pushed down, but then raised up by God. Down, then up. Well, if last week the focus was in living outside these walls in the hostile world out there, then in 1 Peter 5, Peter turns his attention to inside these walls, following the pattern of Christ in the church. And we're going to learn, actually, what James and John needed to learn. Not that we're pushed down inside church, in church, but rather that we step down. We choose the downward path. We choose humility. We serve. And then God lifts us up. That same down than up, the pattern of Christ. Well, Peter starts in the right place. He starts with the elders, the church leaders. Let me read verse 1. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings who will also share in the glory to be revealed. Notice the down suffering, up glory again. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care. He's instructing elders and he tells them to be shepherds. Now the word here, elder, it doesn't just mean those who are older. Really, it's a term you use throughout the Bible for those appointed to positions of leadership in a church. And so in a technical sense, I guess it's particularly Steve, but actually I think these words apply to anyone who leads or teaches or has a position of influence, whether that's for adults or children. Anyone who is caring for members of God's flock. And actually, even if you still think, well, that maybe that's still not me, we all need these words. We all need to hear them. He, he wrote them publicly so that we know what sort of leaders to follow. There was a time in the Old Testament when God rebuked Israel's leaders for being poor shepherds. I thought I'd read a few of these verses. They're from Ezekiel 34. Hear God's rebuke for those bad shepherds. Woe to you, shepherds of Israel, who only take care of yourselves. Should not shepherds take care of the flock? You eat the curds, clothe yourselves with the wool, and slaughter the choice animals. But you do not take care of the flock. You have not strengthened the weak or healed the sick or bound up the injured. You have not brought back the strays or searched for the lost. You have ruled them harshly and brutally. Well, that's what God thinks bad leadership is. Gaining for yourself, but not caring about the flock. Yet church leaders are to be the opposite, to care for the flock, strengthen the weak, Feed the hungry, search the lost. But notice that in our passage, 1 Peter 5, he's not so much interested in 
what leaders ought to do, but rather the manner, the character in which they do it. He's got these three pairings in verses 2 and 3. We're going to slow down and look at these a little bit. See the first one, verse 2. Be shepherds, not because you must, but because you are willing. So how should a leader shepherd? Or willingly, because they want to. Not purely out of some, oh, I have to do this sort of duty. As I was thinking about this, I was uh, struck by that story, that occasion that happened to Peter himself in the Gospels. You know that time after Jesus had risen again and then he cooked his disciples fish for breakfast. At home we always then say, yuck, fish for breakfast. But that's what they had. And Jesus asked Peter three times, he asked him, do you love me? like those three times that Peter denied Jesus. And three times Peter replied, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. But I wonder if you can remember what Jesus says after each time. He said, feed my lambs, take care of my sheep, feed my sheep. No wonder Peter picks up on the shepherding picture here. The point is that Peter's love for Jesus is what enabled him to love Jesus' sheep. That it wasn't some kind of duty alone, but that he had a love for Jesus and so willingly took care of his sheep. I think it's so easy, though, for that willingness to kind of drift a bit like when you're swimming at the beach and you look up and you're a lot further from where you started. And so, those of us leading, we need to remember, I love these sheep. They're Jesus' sheep. Well, that's the first of these pairings. The second one is just there at the end of verse 2. Not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. Now, primarily, this is actually about money. Elsewhere, Paul says that um, uh, false teachers, they taught for love of money. But I actually think that we could expand this a bit to that leader's focus. Where is their focus? Is it on themselves for their gain? You know, all this person, how could they be used for my advantage? How could they make my life easier? Or how could this situation make things better for me? Or is their focus on the sheep, eager to serve, even if you won't even get a thank you in return? And then the third one, start of verse 3. Not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. It's like what Jesus said to James and John, isn't it? Not the world's way, the way of politicians, business leaders. You know, I wonder if anyone read that thing about a particular online clothing shop this week and the conditions that their lowest paid staff have to work in their warehouses. A reporter did the job of a picker for a week and described it as dehumanizing, mind and body destroying. And he described a situation in which the management just didn't care about those people. They just cared about the targets. But leaders after the pattern of Christ are more concerned with the flock than with outcomes. More concerned with the people than what these people can do for them or the church. And so they don't go around beating the flock from the back. But instead they go ahead of the flock, living as an example for others to follow. Sadly, though, in recent years, there have been a number of examples of churches, some not too far from here, where leaders have drifted into lording it over their flocks, being domineering, bullying, 
some even abusive. But it doesn't even need to go that far. It starts just by leaders who have good motives, motives to help others, to tell people about Jesus, but then their methods become a bit skewed. They start going about things the way they want to do. They cut corners in processes. They shut out those who don't agree. They start manipulating people. I know of one church where the leader just talks so much that no one else ever can even disagree. And the problem is, is that that's the kind of leader that actually we naturally often want. Strong, bold leaders. The kind of lord it over you type. Over the meek and humble. That's nothing new. I wonder if you can remember the story of when the people of Israel asked God for a king. And God said that if he gave them the kind of king that other nations have, they'd get a strong, bold leader who would lord it over them, who would take their stuff and make them fight in his army. And you know what they said? Yes, give us a king like that. And so he gave them Saul. But then... I think what they ended up with was an insecure leader. Often someone who wants to be really successful. You know, Saul wanted to be a really successful king. And he was insecure, so he started trying to bully others, do whatever it takes to make himself successful. But that's not the pattern of Christ. The pattern of Christ is humility being content just to shepherd, to serve, to be an example so that the sheep under your care may grow. And if the church doesn't grow, then so be it. That's fine. Because it's the flock that matter. I know of one church, uh, none of you will know it. At the moment, this church does have a manipulative leader that they can't get rid of. And not everyone in the church sees it. Many think he's wonderful because he's this gifted preacher and he's skilled and he's a good leader. And yet the church is actually dying. People just keep leaving. And I just wish that their eyes would be opened. Because what churches need are not skilled leaders primarily... Certainly not flashy leaders. What they need are humble shepherds. People of godly character. Who will lead by example. And can I just say. That this is what you have in Steve. I'm going to embarrass Steve for a minute now. Tell you a little story. Um. I think the best way to tell if a leader is humble is the way they respond to criticism. Because every leader is a sinner. Every leader gets things wrong. And there was a time, uh, years and years ago, I spent six years working closely with Steve. And I remember vividly one situation where I needed to give him some feedback on something. Which, as a 20-something-year-old, was particularly hard to do. But I wanted to say this because Steve's response could not have been more humble. It was exemplary. And I've thought about it many times since. That what matters most before anything else is that humility. And I just wanted you all to be encouraged and to get behind Steve. Well, let's get back to our passage. Verse 4 gives us the reason why leaders do this. I don't think this is the only reason, but a good reason. Verse 4. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. It's that pattern. Down in humility and then uplifted by God to glory. So that's leaders. We're going to speed up a little bit now and we're going to move on to everyone. First... The younger, in verse 5. It's a much simpler instruction, verse 5. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. 
I would guess Peter knew of that youthful tendency to think you know what's best. But that's not the way. And in fact, the way is summed up in his instruction to all the church there in the second half of the verse. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility to one another. Humility. I think this picture of clothing yourselves is such a good one. Because so often we use our clothes, don't we, to try and tell people something about ourselves. You know, I'm the trendy one. Perhaps I'm the wealthy one. Or I'm the different one. I'm the unique one. Or whatever it is. We use our clothes to show what we are. And yet, Peter says that what we want people to see is the beauty of our humility beyond anything else. And Peter quotes a proverb there. God opposes the, opposes the proud but shows favour to the humble. This is why. Because actually there are only two options in life. There's the proud and there's the humble. You can be proud, living for yourself, making your life all you want it to be. But what a warning to have the God, the maker and sustainer of all things, care about an individual, a mere human, and opposing them because of their pride. But then the other option, humility. To choose that lower path, that downward service, and God will lift them up and show them favour. And it's so important that Peter says it twice, verse 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, as if we hadn't already got the point. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hands, that he may lift you up in due time. And if that's the principle, I think verse 7 shows us what it can look like. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Because actually the path of pride, at its heart, is pride before God. Saying to God, actually I'm good enough, I can do life on my own, I don't need you. But at the heart of humility is that recognition that we can't, that we need God that says, have mercy on me, a sinner, and then cast everything, all of our anxieties and worries and concerns, upon him, upon his caring hands. So there we have it, the pattern of the life as worked out within the church, stepping down in humility, serving, giving ourselves to others, before being lifted up, favoured by God, and ultimately brought to the joy of glory. But as we draw towards our end, I wanted to just say that it's not just joy in the future, this pattern of life. That actually this way of life is the best life that you could live now as well. I wonder if you can remember that story in John 13. I'm going to read a verse from it. You can turn there if you like. You don't have to. John 13. It's that time, the Last Supper, before Jesus' death. That moment when he got up from the table, removed his outer clothing, took the form of a servant and, and washed his disciples' smelly, dirty feet. The pattern of Christ in action, we might say. And it's humility, isn't it? Jesus didn't think he was their servant. He wasn't kind of deluded. He knew he was the son of God, mighty and powerful. And yet he chose to serve those below him. And he even washed the feet of Judas, who moments later would leave to betray him to his death. And he knew it, but he washed even his enemy's feet. But then as he finished, 
he told them why he did it. It's there, John 13, verse 15. I'm going to read it. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. An example that I'm sure Peter thought of, perhaps even daily. The pattern of Christ, humility, service, putting others first. And for Jesus, it even took him to the cross. But then, just two verses later, in verse 17, Jesus says this. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Blessed because following this pattern isn't just for glory in the future, although it is that, but it's a blessed thing now. It is a better life, a life to the full, life that, although often hard, and it was hard for Jesus to go to the cross, it was a life that is good and fulfilling, and satisfying, and yes, joyful. So yes, joy in the future that motivates us through the hard times of suffering, and when serving is particularly tiresome perhaps. But joy now as well. And actually, since we're in John 13, if you've got it open, look at verse 34. I'll read it if you don't. Jesus says, A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And here's the key bit. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. I wonder how we'd naturally finish that sentence. Everyone will know we're the disciples of the mighty Son of God if we're successful. If our church grows, well, then we must be doing something right. No, none. that's not what Jesus says. He says, by this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. This pattern of life that we've seen today is so fundamental. The heart of church is not primarily about what we do, but our attitude to one another. Our love patterned on Jesus himself. Our humble self-sacrifice patterned on his humble self-sacrifice. And yes, it's so important that, you know, we put on carol services and we invite our neighbours and we pray that they'd respond to the message. But how will they know that we're disciples of the King? That we're the real deal? If we love one another. Our humble love. I'll finish with this. I don't suppose anyone has heard of John Couch Adams. I'd be very surprised if you have. In the 1840s, he made a name for himself by discovering Neptune. But what was particularly unique about this is that it was the first time a planet had been discovered using maths. Okay, so you can imagine, you know, in the past, the way you discover a planet is you look in your telescope and, hey, there's a new planet. You add it to the list. But instead, he was looking through his telescope at a different planet. And he noticed an irregularity in its orbit. And he realized there must be another unseen planet out there. It's gravitational pull tugging on this planet. Well, he did the maths. And he was able to work out exactly where this other planet must be. And so too, as the world watches us, the church, as they see our humble love, they too will see irregularities, things that deviate from how the world expects them to go. And Jesus says that the only explanation is the gravitational pull of another greater and unseen presence.
But actually, even if they don't see, God sees. I was tempted to end with some sort of motivational example of a great Christian who's done some sort of extraordinary act of self-sacrifice. But actually, I think that misses the point. Because really, it's about all of us. And how we each have humble acts, how we each humble ourselves towards each other. Those small, unknown acts of kindness, those unseen areas of service, those countless demonstrations of love that are hidden for now, but will one day be revealed in glory. How many untold stories of love will be discovered in glory? How many reunions of gratitude and revelations of joy that some act of kindness humbly led another to Christ? You know, there's beauty hidden all around. And it's the beauty of this pattern of life, the pattern of Christ. Stepping down in humility to serve and love one another.